Okay, welcome, palypidologists. Um, at this point in the course, we are done with the five factors of soil formation. We went through all five, the clawed approach to studying uh, paleosols. Uh, and now we have the tools, um, the classification, the basic ideas, and a few mechanisms for reconstructing things to get to a history of uh, soils on Earth, a worm's eye view of the evolution of the Earth and its uh, biota. And um, we start out with um, one of my favorite topics, which is soils in space, with apologies to Miss Piggy. Um, soils in space are um, the uh, soils that form uh, on, um, the, on uh, different planetary uh, bodies. Uh, which give us a perspective on um, soil formation in a very, very ancient um, Earth. Um, I like to call this kind of uh, soil science astropedology. My student Adrian Brose and I have taken on this as a as kind of a special study um, to try and set, um, uh, we're particularly interested in soils on Mars, of course, with the recent rover, Percy, that went up there. Um, but we're also interested in um, learning about what things were like on other planets as a, as a backdrop to um, soil formation on Earth. Um, the bottom line is that um, souls in space are just really weird um, and very um, interesting. Uh, we just dropped a video on, on YouTube. If you Google astropedology, you should be able to find it uh, pretty easily, a kind of a promotional video, and uh, I have other lectures on um, astropedology uh, that you can find on YouTube as well. Um, but um, soils in space, one of the weirdest um, of um, the soils that form in space is forming on our, our very own moon. Um, our very own moon is kind of um, odd. It's only uh, 0 0.02 times mass of um, Earth, uh, so a tenth the size. Um, the moon has no um, uh, granite, um, no real quartz sandstone. Um, it's mainly basalt. Um, there's also a, a lot of an unusual felspathic rock, um, which is a northazite. Uh, television audiences were um, amazed in uh, the 1970s that even astronauts knew about a northazite. There's no evidence of life yet of any sort. Um, there's very little evidence of water. Uh, it seems to be dry as a bone. Um, maybe a little bit um, in the poles, which is actually um, frozen. Um, there's virtually no atmosphere to speak of. Um, it um, at low gravity, um, very different kind of a world. Um, and the main source of uh, modification of the surface of the moon is not running water or plants or, or animals. Um, it is a micrometeoroid uh, bombardment. <clears throat> um, a micrometeoroid, we call it an, an oid rather than an ite because um, an ite is something that lands on Earth. An oid is something that is um, in space. Um, there's a continual bombardment of the moon by particles um, that are basically of uh, sand uh, size. Um, if we look at the um, at a diagram of the um, particle mass in space and grams, 10 to the 2, 100 grams, 10 to the minus 6, that's basically like a, like a silk particle. Um, 10 to the minus 16, uh, 10 to the minus 2. This is particle flux. Um, which is uh, meteoroids. Per meter squared um, per second. Um, we can uh, make observations from um, craters. Um, these are uh, craters. And we can also uh, make observations from um, satellites. 
um, and from spacecraft that went to the moon and came back again, um, out on the moon um, and in, in space, uh, there are lots of uh, tiny uh, pieces um, of uh, material uh, that are uh, raining down on the surface of um, our satellites, uh, our space station, and of course um, our, our, our landers. And it forms a continuum. Um, there's some big pieces out there too, uh, like bits of the, plates, the, the, the space station and defunct satellites that um, are rather bigger. Uh, but there's an inverse relationship um, in that the, um, the small ones are coming in at a fantastic rate, um, not quite like a snowstorm, but you, you sort of feel it like being on a beach on a somewhat windy day. Um, the really big ones come at very rare intervals at, at many um, thousands or even millions of years. And so um, on the moon, we have this battle between uh, impact which will scatter coarse debris from um, the impact of a large uh, body uh, and a continuing gardening with the tiny ones. So this is um, gardening of the small uh, particles, which are uh, just falling into the soil at um, sometimes quite high velocity and uh, enough high velocity to actually melt the soil slightly and to move it apart. And, and some of those uh, pieces are um, actually also uh, metal because some of the meteoroids are uh, metallic meteoroids of iron and nickel. We get big ones and we get little ones. We get a whole spectrum of, uh, of sizes. So uh, it's an unusual, so we have a series of paleosols on the moon well, we can recognize these garden layers, these micro garden layers, um, which uh, separate these breccia, these impact breccias. Uh, this then is a paleosol. A whole bunch of these were found um, in um, a core that was taken by the Apollo uh, missions. There are some other effects too. Uh, there uh, is electrostatic transport. Some of the really fine grain material on the on the moon, uh, we were worried it would be too fine grained to even put a lander up there initially, but it turns out it's not that fine grained after all. Um, some of the fine grain material actually gathers a charge um, from uh, the sun, um, and uh, this is actually visible on the horizon. Um, uh, you can see um, the material which is lifted up very very slightly, um, and um, then um, will fall down. Um, when it becomes uh, dark again on the on the dark um, on the dark side of the moon's orbit um, around uh, around the sun, um, there are also thermal effects. Um, the moon um, on the on the on the sun side on the sunny side is of course uh, quite warm. Um, on the other side, it's quite cold. And there's a little bit of alternation between the sides, even though the moon. Uh, keeps the same orientation toward uh, the sun. Uh, these thermal effects uh, create a certain amount of uh, mixing. There is solar wind sputtering. The solar wind has ionized particles within it, and those ionized particles can um, impinge upon the surface of mineral grains on the surface of the soil and create tiny pits, just about a micron or a millionth of a meter in size. This is a very minor uh, effect, but nevertheless, um, we're talking about a lot of relatively minor effects um, here. Um, there also are uh, Taylor slopes. There are uh, crack-like valleys on the moon. Uh, Hadley Rill is a famous one. Um, and um, you can see in the bottom of that, uh, of that rill, there's places where material has fallen uh, down. Uh, presumably there's also soil creep on that, um, on that slope. So it's a weird, weird world, uh, quite different from um, our, um, our soil formation uh, on Earth. 
um, and the composition of the lunisole, therefore, is um, is pretty is pretty different from um, the composition of soils on Earth, the composition of the lunar soil, and they called it the lunar soil. They did that from the very start because they wanted people to understand um, what um, they were talking about. If they called it lunar regolith or some fancy term like that, it's a soil. And after all, since our astronauts walked on it, that makes it a soil. Um, if, you, if you have to have life on a soil, well, it's now a soil because there was life on it, at least transiently. Uh, the composition uh, includes rock fragments, And these range in size from the size of a house, big, big fragments of basalt or an orthozoite that were actually um, uh, tossed up by a large uh, asteroid um, impact. Um, there are mineral grains, individual mineral grains that uh, were uh, from the rocks themselves. Um, these um, largely include uh, plagioclase. Um, one of the more common components of basalt, um, but um, but also um, uh, uh, pyroxene, very common uh, component, um, ilmenite, um, and just metal, lots of metal. Um, metal um, would be just iron, nickel from um, the iron uh, meteorites. Um, one easy way, actually, to detect metal um, in uh, the lunar core was to measure the magnetic susceptibility. Uh, which is the ability of a material to enhance an applied magnetic uh, field. Uh, so the, the lunar soil becomes somewhat paramagnetic because a good proportion of the material in the soil is um, meteoritic uh, metal, iron, nickel, uh, meteorite material. Uh, most of the stuff um, in the lunar soil, however, is glass. Uh, and there are two different uh, sorts, um, homogeneous um, and these are uh, sometimes dumbbells or uh, droplets of glass. Um, these are from uh, these micrometeoroid uh, impacts. When a micrometeoroid, or even a bigger one, hits the surface of the, of the moon, uh, the impact energy, that, that, that kinetic energy, is, is turned into heat. Um, and that kinetic energy then melts the rock, uh, throws up a, a, a droplet, and these will harden um, as glass that fall back into the soil. Um, and then the other sort, which is really very um, common, are agglutinates. Uh, which look like um, a voodoo donut, one that, or um, a donut that has lots of nuts in it. <clears throat> um, in this um, agglutinate, this is the glass here, and these are minerals here. What's happened in this case is that instead of throwing uh, a molten drop of soil up into the air where it can cool, um, that molten material has just infused it. The, the micrometeoroid landed right here. These are, these are microscopic, um, just um, a, a millimeter or less uh, in size. Uh, and the material of the glass has just infused and uh, cemented together the minerals uh, surrounding it. Um, and the agglutinates, uh, if they're perfectly formed, will form this kind of a donut. Uh, but then another micrometeor will come along and break it into pieces as well. So they're of all different, all, all different sorts. So um, soil development <clears throat> uh, on the moon uh, consists of um, the uh, increase in uh, agglutinates. Oops, agglutinates uh, plus metal and an increase in magnetic susceptibility. Um, how long does that take? Um, a long, long time. 
um, the uh, core uh, that was drilled near, uh, near Headley Rill um, had uh, several of these um, paleosol horizons in it, just three or four, um, and um, had an age of, of um, three billion years at the bottom. Uh, so it's taking hundreds of millions of years to form a soil only a few tens of centimeters thick on, um, on the moon. Um, the most um, efficient and effective soil forming event on the moon were the lunar landers and the footprints that were left by astronauts uh, with the Apollo uh, program. A very um, unusual form of, of soil formation, this um, one that involves no life, it's largely physical weathering um, and um, a um, not too much chemical weathering, no biology that we're aware of, um, but um, one that we can imagine on other uh, planetary uh, bodies. Well, how about Venus? Uh, the planet Venus um, is um, about the same size as the Earth. But unlike the Earth, um, it has a very high, uh, high temperature, um, about 450 degrees uh, centigrade at the surface of the Earth. Um, uh, it has an atmosphere largely of CO2 uh, plus SO4. So you have carbonic and sulfuric acid in the atmosphere, pretty darn noxious. And the atmosphere is so heavy that it has a weight of 92 bars, 92 times the atmospheric pressure at the surface of, um, of Venus. Very, very hard uh, to um, walk around there. Um, you need it be that would be equivalent to, to diving to several kilometers in the world's ocean today, just under the air itself. Um, so a very, very different kind of soil uh, forming environment. Uh, we, there's lots of uh, basalt. Um, no granite as far as we can tell. And um, we don't think there's plate tectonics. But um, all the landscapes of Venus appear to be um, relatively young. Uh, um, and I mean less than about 500 million years or so, uh, there's some form of crustal recycling going on. We're not quite sure what it is. Uh, it could be that there are episodic, catastrophic resurfacing events. Uh, but we're not finding uh, the same sorts of uh, crater counts uh, on Venus, which give us an idea of surface ages, that we find on Mercury or uh, on the Moon or on, uh, or on Mars. Um, it could be that everything just melts under this kind of a uh, an atmosphere and, and temperature, and that's the resurfacing uh, mechanism um, right there. We're not quite sure what the mechanisms of um, uh, soil formation are. Um, we think it's probably uh, some sort of um, gas solid chemical reaction. At this temperature, there's no water. There's no running water. Um, there's no um, uh, dilute solutions that are working on things. Um, we think it's probably a gas solid uh, reactions. Uh, there is wind. Um, we see evidence of wind deposition uh, and erosion. Um, there do appear to be ripple marks in places. Um, and there's some evidence also of um, landslides. And also big impacts. Um, they're all big, the impacts we have on, uh, on Venus, uh, because uh, even an asteroid the size of a football won't make it to the surface. It'll burn up in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is so thick and so hot. Almost everything we know um, about um, Venus came from two probes that were um, launched by the Russians in the 1960s, Venera uh, 13 and uh, Venera uh, 14. Um, we have been able to probe Venus with radar to see the um, uh, impact structures, the craters, um, and the winds and, and the landslides. Um, and uh, we've had uh, probes in the atmosphere to sample atmospheric uh, composition. Uh, but these two Russian probes were the only ones that lasted on the surface 
for any length of time, at least enough time uh, to uh, take some pictures. And the pictures they brought back were kind of stunning. Grainy, but stunning. It looked like one surface was had sort of cracks in it, and it looked like it had ripple marks. It looked like a fairly freshly dried out sedimentary um, rock. Um, although the compositions were largely uh, basaltic, uh, evidently some sort of a basaltic uh, sediment. And as people have pointed out, at 92 bars, it could be that sedimentation on the surface of Venus was rather like a turbidite in the deep sea um, on Earth. Um, the atmosphere is so thick that it would have had some properties uh, quite a bit like that of, um, of water. Uh, in Venera 14, on the other hand, um, we have these sort of molten slabs of material uh, that are kind of all kind of melted together. It looks, looks like if you put several slices of cheese on a piece of toast and um, heated it up, it's kind of a, like, a, like a patty melt. Um, it looks like the sort of soil formation that's happening on Venus is rather like what happens in a potter's um, kiln. There evidently is dust that can form ripple marks in some places, and that dust you can imagine like the flux or of, uh, of a potter's uh, glaze uh, that this material uh, could um, then uh, form um, a kind of a molten, slaggy um, surface. Pretty bizarre, but uh, super um, interesting. Now these are these are there's no life involved in either of these as far as we can tell. It was a bit of a buzz about some chemicals in the atmosphere of Venus indicating life, uh, but that seems to have gone away uh, more recently. Uh, these are about as bizarre um, soil forming processes as one uh, could um, one could imagine. But when it comes to Mars, suddenly it's a lot more interesting. When it comes to Mars, we have a world um, which is um, pretty different than Earth. Um, Mars is only um, about 16% um, uh, of the mass of the Earth, so it's a lot smaller. Um, and that means it doesn't have the great amount of, um, of volatiles. It has low gravity. Um, the atmosphere is mainly CO2. Um, and um, it's really cold, zero to minus um, 80 degrees uh, centigrade. Um, about as cold as the dry valleys of Antarctica, which many people who are interested in Martian conditions have visited in order to assess uh, the kinds of soil conditions um, that may, soil forming conditions that might be um, on Mars. Um, we have um, a wonderful set of images of the entire planet now. There's even a Google Mars. You can look it up. Um, it's sometimes attached to Google Earth. Um, there's a Google Moon as well. Um, we have lots and lots of pictures uh, which uh, tell us a lot about, uh, about Mars um, itself. Um, we can see um, plenty of evidence of wind erosion. There are dunes, uh, and then there are occasional planetary um, dust storms. There are lots of fluvial channels, uh, but these are generally uh, greater than 3.7 billion years old. Um, they appear to be braided streams. They may have been rather um, ephemeral. Uh, there are also some sort of meandering type streams, not quite like a meandering stream on Earth, but somewhat uh, somewhat similar. Um, it doesn't look like any of these, judging from crater counts, were active um, for the last 3.7 um, billion years um, after what in Martian chronology is called the Hesperian. So um, we, we have a series of um, eras in Earth history. They have another series uh, for um, mapping Mars, and there are geological maps of uh, Mars. Uh, there are lots of impact craters. Um, and many of these have uh, the crater itself, but have these kind of um, splosh marks. Um, this um, suggests um, that um, there is um, 
permafrost. Uh, that was melted uh, by the um, impact um, itself. Um, there are uh, pits that appear to be uh, thermocast, like the pits that are now um, appearing um, in uh, Siberia with uh, global melting. There are glaciers um, at the North and the South Pole. Um, some of these glaciers are not only water ice, but also um, dry ice or CO2 ice. There's a big volcano, one big one, and there's probably other um, that's called Olympus Mons. Um, and uh, volcanism was probably a feature of, um, of Mars um, evolution. Uh, and there also are uh, tabletop mountains. I uh, like the ones that we have around Hoodoo Ski Bowl in, um, in Oregon. And like them, we think that those are due to the intrusion of uh, volcanic um, rocks um, into um, a, um, a frozen ground or at the bottom of a, um, a glacial. So these are subglacial intrusions. It's a long way from the sun, so it's a little bit colder um, and, uh, and weirder. Uh, than um, we see um, uh, in, 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 in the Earth. But there's a lot of Earth-like features here. Um, and many people, of course, are invested in the idea that this may be a habitable uh, planet. Uh, with no oxygen and a largely CO2 atmosphere, which is relatively thin, it's hard to get to land there. Uh, it's been kind of a technical triumph that we have um, two rovers the size of Mini Coopers up there now, and a bunch of other little robots as well um, from um, almost a decade or so, or, or from several decades of, of research on, uh, on Mars. Uh, and there are paleosols. Um, some of the nicest paleosols were found by a Curiosity rover. Um, and I published this in 2014. They were found at a place called Yellowknife Bay. Um, at Yellowknife Bay, there's a sandstone uh, cap, which is the Gillespie Formation. Um, and it goes down into the, the lower um, clay and silty rocks, which uh, show a pair of what appear to be uh, paleosols. Paleosols show um, some interesting features. I'm going to put some of these in black and leave some of them open. Um, this material here um, is a silty uh, claystone, a smectite. Um, it has uh, vesicles at the top. This vesicular top of the, of the profile is very similar to a desert soil on Earth where the vesicles are found, uh, formed by the bubbling up of gases produced um, by microbes. Um, down the bottom here, there's a mineral called bassanite, which is an oddly hydrated form of gypsum. Uh, it's a calcium sulfate mineral. Uh, this is another uh, similarity um, with desert soils on Earth. Uh, it was an acid sulfate soil with an A horizon, a B Y horizon, and a C. The one below it is the same. And both of these I call um, the Yela pedotype. I don't know if you remember Yela from, um, there's one here and there's one here. Yela was the Martian lady uh, in Ray Badbury's Martian Chronicles um, who killed the astronaut, the first astronaut um, who, um, who arrived. We can identify this um, in the U.S. taxonomy. Uh, both of them are gypsic and high orthels. Uh, they are formed um, in a dry environment. Uh, the geological age of these 
um, is uh, 3.7 billion years. Now, we only know that from uh, crater counts. Um, we also did a potassium argon age on the surface of the outcrop. And the outcrop surface itself is actually um, close uh, to um, this Cretaceous in age, like uh, 70 million years or so. Um, what's happening here um, is that we have um, a, an environment in which there is hydrolytic weathering and acid sulfate weathering both, and that is uh, converting olivine to uh, smectite. We have these analyses uh, from the rover which give us these compositions. This is a fairly modest form of soil formation, but pretty uh, comparable uh, to the uh, sort of soil formation we get in um, arid um, polar deserts today, like the dry valleys of um, Antarctica. Um, there would have been water uh, present at this time, 3.7 billion years ago. Uh, we know that from the channels as well. Uh, this is a, a kind of a hydrous weathering uh, kind of um, alteration. Uh, they were in lowlands. They were very arid, probably only a few hundred millimeters, mean annual rainfall. They probably formed in a frigid climate. This, um, this, this feature here looks very similar to an ice wedge. Um, and um, they uh, probably formed over time spans quite, quite similar uh, to um, similar soils in Antarctica um, in, the, in that kind of a frigid climate where soils can form um, uh, like this over periods of just about a half million to one and a half million years or so. Uh, we get a pretty good idea um, about um, Mars from the soil itself. Um, there are soils like this um, also in the Archean on Earth, but that's another story which I'll get to in a bit. And that's why what makes this so so interesting. Uh, Mars appears to be a very well preserved example of soil formation uh, on the early on the early Earth. Um, uh, there's more going to be found, of course, by Percy. Percy is up there and operational, landed successfully, um, and is in the Jezero Crater area of um, the, uh, of Mars, unlike um, Curiosity, which was in, in Gale uh, Crater. Uh, and um, I can't wait to see what uh, what Jezero, what they find next in uh, in Jezero. Well, it turns out that there are actually also older paleosalts as well. And these are the carbonaceous chondrites. Carbonaceous chondrites are meteorites um, that um, are chondrites, meaning they have chondrules within them. There's a certain class of meteorite that are metal. Most meteorites are metal, actually, because they seem to be the ones that um, most easily withstand the weathering when they land on Earth. Um, but there's a certain class of meteorites that has these rounded chondrules of molten material, usually uh, pyroxene or olivine. Um, these are high temperature um, minerals that would have formed at around about a thousand degrees centigrade or so. Um, they are thought to have formed by impacts in um, the um, solar cloud, the, the, the solar disk that um, eventually um, became um, our solar system. Uh, but uh, uh, the, chondri the chondrite meteorites have lots of these chondrules, but the carbonaceous chondrites are quite fascinating in that these chondrules are set within a matrix uh, that consists largely of smectite and organic matter. Now I put organic matter in, um, I'll put it in quotation marks. Um, these are organic compounds including sugars, amino acids, um, the formaldehyde, a whole variety of normally organic compounds, but we're pretty certain that they were formed um, inorganically. Um, they form big, and that's because um, when you have amino acids, they come in both left-handed and right-handed versions. That's not how life makes them. Life makes them of one sort or another. Generally in amino acids, they're in right-handed versions. Um, it's so that it's kind of like lefty, um, left, 
lefty loosey, righty tighty. Um, for organisms, you have to have the components be um, a single hand. It would be, be terrible if you have a mix of screws that screwed in in different ways to make an organism. But for abiotic assembly of organic matter uh, by the Yuri Miller experiment, uh, Yuri um, Stan uh, uh, Miller and his student and his advisor, Harold Yuri, did this experiment uh, producing organic matter uh, in the lab by processes that they thought would be um, fairly um, reasonable uh, for um, the early Earth or the early uh, solar system, they formed this kind of mix of organic of organic matter. Also in carbonaceous chondrites, we have calcite. We have gypsum. We have dolomite. Um, dolomite. Um, these are salts. It seems pretty clear that what's happening in these uh, carbonaceous chondrites, these meteorites, is that they formed by hydrolysis. In other words, the pyroxene and olivine were turned into smectite, just like they were on the Martian soil. Um, and um, the salts that were liberated by that hydrolysis reaction um, drifted off to form calcite, gypsum, dolomite, and other salts in the um, in the um, in the meteorite itself. Now this is quite stunning because they're all about 4.5 billion years old. These things date. We can date the pyroxene and olivine uh, with uranium dating, and they're all about as old as the whole solar system. Uh, we can envisage these as little bits of soil that have rained out of the sky, largely from the asteroid belt, left over uh, from planetismals at the very early phase of our solar system. Now, most of them come from the asteroid belt, and they're often perturbed um, by um, comets or other uh, things streaking through our solar system, so that they eventually fall uh, down to Earth. It used to be thought that the asteroid belt was a broken up planet of some sort, um, but uh, I think the consensus is now that the asteroid belt is really um, a set of planetismals that never could coalesce because they were sort of stuck um, and um, in a, just beyond the uh, gravitational pull of uh, Jupiter. Uh, between Jupiter and the Sun, they could never, uh, they could never uh, coalesce because Jupiter is so, so, uh, so, so massive. Uh, so these carbonaceous chondrites, I think, are the remnants of proto-planetary soils that found formed on 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 uh, on on planetismals 4.5 billion years ago. We still can see these um, forming on the surface of um, asteroids like Vesta. Uh, within the asteroid uh, belt and uh, Ceres. Uh, these are two um, bodies that appear to have, um, they're very similar to planetismals from the very, very early stages um, of uh, the, solar, the solar system. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a very um, interesting kind of early uh, soil uh, that's preserved. Um, this is the beginning. Uh, we're part way along to a Martian soil here, um, eventually Martian soils, which were also are found on the early Earth. We, we imagine these were found on the early Earth as well. Eventually, um, they evolved with the evolution of life um, into the great array of um, different sorts of uh, soils that we have today. What happened on Earth, also on Mars, of course, is the planet uh, differentiated um, and became a... Um, a um, uh, a, a planet with a core and a crust, um, and um, we have um, a, um, a whole set of different processes that, that come um, into, uh, into play. Uh, so um, if we want to look at a history of um, soils in the universe, uh, we have carbonaceous chondrites, 4.5 uh, billion years old.
Uh, some of these were uh, subsequently uh, modified. Uh, there's a kind of uh, meteorite which has a kind of a breccia. These are meteorites called mesosiderites. And these mesosiderite meteorites um, look very similar uh, to the breccia soils of um, the moon. Um, on, um, on Mars, we have a kind of a soil which now has some um, smectite to it and has uh, sulfates. Um, on Venus, uh, we have uh, a kind of a soil which is just kind of melt layers. Um, and then eventually, once you get uh, once you get trees into the picture and an active biota um, on Earth, uh, you develop a big array of soils, including alpha soils, mollusols, vertisols, a whole array of different soils that reflect different climate um, and geographic situations um, on uh, on the Earth. Um, a lot of people have thought the soils in space idea. Um, which was in my the first edition of my soil textbook in 1990 was not necessary. Nobody would be interested in that. But of course now we're all interested in it because uh, we have such a big presence on Mars. And maybe um, you'll see uh, colonization of Mars and even um, attempts at agricultural exploitation of Mars, as in the movie um, The Martian. That's going to be tough because the Martian soil has a lot of chlorides and nasty stuff in it. But Human ingenuity, of course, knows few bounds, and we can look forward to a very productive output from astropodology in the next few years. Well, that'll do it for today. Thanks for your attention.